following program is a Channel 8 Telecolor presentation. With the Frito Kid and Snake Bit Sam going... It says here, Jay, that President Kennedy has been given blood transfusions in part. It's the award-winning Group and Chapman. We'll be back in just a moment. It's six minutes before the hour. Good night. Better tomorrow. One moment along with the other male on Let Me Speak to the Manager. 18-month-old Jessica McClure has been rescued. Forty years on eight. A look back. Brought to you by McDonald's of Greater North Texas. By KBIL Radio, celebrating a proud past and a spectacular future. By Mervyn's, celebrating 40 years with you. And by your neighborhood 7-Eleven, the sign of the times. Television has been called the most powerful social instrument ever devised. It's become a permanent fixture in our homes. Three-fourths of the adult American public watch some television every day. Ninety-seven percent of us watch some every week. But that wasn't the case a mere 40 years ago. Dallas at that time had no television station. That is, until September 17, 1949. So on this very date, 40 years ago, Channel 8 signed on the air for the first time, and things have never been quite the same. As a matter of fact, even our call letters are not the same. So to mark the occasion of our 40th birthday, we thought it would be fun to dig into our vault, pull out some old footage, and relive some of our memories. For those of you who have grown up in Dallas with us, we hope you enjoy getting reacquainted with many old friends during the next hour. And for those of you who, like myself, have moved here, we hope you too will enjoy taking a look back at some very special moments in broadcasting here at Channel 8. So stay with us, and in just a moment, we'll begin our story by returning to 1949. WFAA TV was the first television outlet in Dallas, and the original call letters were KBTV. The year was 1949, and if you happen to be watching television in Dallas on September 17th, you probably were watching on a receiver much like this one. It's a Halicrafter Model T-54 with a 5-inch screen. What you would have seen at 8 o'clock that night was the Vice President of the United States, Alvin Barclay, cutting a ribbon that put KBTV Channel 8 on the air. Television had come to Dallas. The call letters for Channel 8 were KBTV. And a new studio had been built on Harry Hines. Oil man Tom Potter had been granted an operating license, and on September 17, 1949, the vice president was in town to put the station on the air with a two-hour variety review. The station was affiliated with the Dumont Television Network and broadcast less than four hours a day, and Tom Potter lost money. I guess he thought it was going to be like an oil well and make a lot of money at the beginning, and it lost a lot of money, and he wanted to get out. So we bought it and finally went on the air. Um, under WFAA in March 21st, 1950. In the early days, we had people who were just experimenting because no one really knew how to, about television. It was just the fun of doing and the fun of playing uh, television and uh, experimenting and learning and, um, and again, realizing that, uh, that what we did was, uh, was going on all over town. People knew of us and knew, you know, knew what we were doing. Back in those days, television was fun. It was just a lot of fun because you could come to work in the morning uh, and have an idea for a program and have it on the air that afternoon. I asked them if they just wouldn't let me get out on the camera and do this, you know, program previews. So that's really what started the Bob Stanford Show. Stanford was really Channel 8's first personality and was involved in several early programs. But the one he's most remembered for began like this. Well, here it is Wednesday. And that means that it's time for the Frito Kid. Snake Pit Sam was played by Earl Marvin, known as Easy Marvin. Lulu Bell was played by Stanford's wife Agnes. And Bob Stanford played the Frito Kid. The sequences were filmed around Dallas. And the Frito Kid was a takeoff on uh, 
kind of a Western Popeye. Instead of eating spinach, why the Frito kid would eat Fritos. And his uh, strength came from the Fritos. And for the first time, Dallas got to see itself on television. And now we find Snake with Sam, Frito Kid, and Lulabelle. The chase still continues. The three of them going. And now watch this. Snake with Sam pulls off the Frito Kid. There they go once again. A beautiful right by Snake with Sam. And he's up to some kind of devil mission there. What is this? Putting down the Frito Kid on the road? He's going to. No, he can't. He can't run over the Frito Kid with that truck. Pull yourself together, Frito Kid. That truck's coming at you. You've got to save yourself, Frito Kid. Watch out, Frito Kid. It's moving in. Frito Kid, you've got to pull yourself together. And he does. Long enough to poke some of those Fritos, the corn chip that all America likes best, into his mouth. And now, with new energy and with new strength, he managed to muster up enough energy to push back the truck. And once again, our hero is saved for another chapter of the Frito Kid. One of the most popular shows on Channel 8 featured a duck. Hi, everybody. This is Rub Scrub Foot. <laughs> yes, and I'm Uncle Jimmy Weldon saying welcome to the Webster Webfoot Show. We started in 1950, the first children's show there at WFAA. And we were all in the afternoons. Uh, 4.30 to 5, I think it was. We were on, had little children about 10 every day, Cub Scouts and different ones. They usually range from about 3 years to 12, brothers and sisters. And we were sponsored by Sanger Brothers Department Store. Webster was, well, he just, just really, he was just such a little goose. Stop that. I'm a duck. Well, all right, all right, I'm sorry, you were a duck when we first started. I can't see it. Oh, excuse me. Now, Webster, let's kind of remember some of the things we did. You remember when I used to say, listen, what have you done? And you said you were sorry. Yeah. How'd you do that? I'm sorry. All right, that's very good. That's right. Webster. That's right. Now, yeah. well, you, you, you just ruined it. with All right, all right, I will. Webster wants to do an imitation of some famous stars. Who do you want to do? Three bears. The three bears? Yeah. All right, do it. Sure. Don't whisper. Okay, all right, all right, all right, I'll say that. The three bears have just come in from a big walk out in the woods. And as they go into the cabin, Papa Bear says, Someone has been drinking my soda pop. Someone is what? Been drinking my soda pop. He didn't say that. It's my story. All right, I'm sorry, pardon me, Star. You okay? He said someone's been drinking my soda pop. Yeah. All right, what did Mama Bear say? Someone's been drinking my soda pop. Okay, tell us, Star, what did Baby Bear say? Uh. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I know what he was drinking the soda pop. I can see that. Yes, all right, very good. Now, Webster, the last show we did in Dallas was September of 1952. Do you know how long ago that was? Uh -uh. This is 89. This was 37 years ago. I'm only three. That's right, you are. Well, I'm tough. <laughs> That's right, here's the same tough little guy that you remember when you saw him when you were there at that age. Wow. Okay. Um, we came out to California, but WFAA is still our old home, man. We just, we just love everybody here, and we're just so thankful that we could be a part of the 40th anniversary. Uh -huh. Maybe one day we'll be able to come back and see all of you, I hope. Right? Well, right. So, uh, I'm going to talk to him a little bit more, Webster, but f let's just you and I say like we used to on the air. I'm going to say now, until tomorrow, this is Uncle Jimmy Weldon and... Webster, Webster, I love every one of you. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. And many viewers won't forget the time Webster made a cameo appearance on the Frito Kid. One Thanksgiving, we decided it'd be fun if Snake Bit Sam, who was on the Frito Kid, would steal Webster Wedfoot, take him out into the boondocks, some cabin out there, and put him in a roasting pan and cut up some celery and potatoes and carrots and stuff, put the lid on him, shove him in the oven, and say, all right, tune in again next week. Now, think about this. They're just doing this as a gag. Well, they did. And the little children who had been watching Webster and was, they stayed with Bob, they were so upset, literally. The parents were calling and said, what have you done? What if my child is gone in hysterics and all this? Well, I'd gone home and I was having a beer sitting around waiting uh, for supper. And I got a call from the station. Bob, you better get down here. What's the matter? The switchboard is lighting up. 
the kids won't go to bed. The mamas are going crazy. So I had to pull on my Frito kid suit and run down to the studio. And I got out there, and they broke, they uh, broke the interruption, uh, interrupted the uh, programming. And I stepped out there in my suit, and I said, "All right, now, kids, you know me." And I tell it straight: that duck's going to be all right. Channel 8 art director Ben January started out with a puppet doing pencil previews. Later he became Alvarado on Frontier Playhouse. And Alvarado was the marshal and the sheriff and the constable and the postmaster and everything in this little town. The town was uh, one building in a little place called Blind Eagle Gulch. The show was originally called Al's Pals and featured Horace the Horse. The pals were uh, uh, Cicero, Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin, James Wood Jackson was his uh, one of his pals. Then we had uh, uh, Burlap T. Bags. He was a carpet bagger who uh, was always trying to get Al to give him some money. And then we had uh, other several other characters like that. And uh, at, who are you? I'm a horse. I know. I know you're a horse because uh, you've been on my program before, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I recognize you. Oh, I recognize you, too. Who are them fillers? Oh, I don't know. They're, they're, they're doing some television coverage here for us. Television? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yes, you used to do it quite a bit. Yes, I did. I sure did. What's your name, Mr. Horse? My name is Horace the Horse, and I do have a lot of friends, too. You do. I know you do. Yeah, you remember that little filly I used to run around with? Yes, I remember her very well. Yeah. She had a beautiful mane, you know. Yes, I remember she had a beautiful mane. She was my main mare, in fact. <laughs> yes, oh, me. Do I have to go through this again? <laughs> yeah. Say good night, Horace. <laughs> good night. Good night, Horace. <laughs> like uh, all other personalities, we participated in the community uh, and the surrounds. Uh, this was done in Cleburne. They had a Frontier Day celebration, and uh, Alvarado was their uh, uh, star guest. And <clears throat> we robbed a train, as you can probably see from the footage here, and uh, was put in jail and all the, the things that are connected with a Frontier Day's celebration. And then we did, and we did this kind of thing quite a bit. All the personalities had to, of course. Ahead of my story. First. I want you to meet the beautiful Nani Darnell. The magic of television also became magic on television with Dallasite Mark Wilson and his wife, Nani Darnell. The name of the show was Time for Magic. And it went on the air on WFAA, 1954. It lasted for 15 minutes every Tuesday and Thursday from 5.45 to 6 o'clock. The show was sponsored by Dr. Pepper. And the magic words to make the tricks work were Dr. Pepper. You say the magic words, and the trick would work. Wilson later went across town to Channel 4, and then on to network fame and fortune. This is a little trick that I used to do on Time for Magic, and, and before that, when I was the Morton magician, and uh, I did it on the first Magic Land of Alkazam show, and I've done it ever since. It's a thing with a thimble. Watch. Watch the thimble. Here it is. I watch you take a thimble like this, put it here, catch it before it gets away. Now you take the thimble like this, just a second, you take, just a minute, I, I'll get it. It's just a, wait, I'll grab both fingers. It's, I've had this problem ever since I was, you know, 20 years old. And I, wait a minute, I thought I had it, I didn't. Now watch, you take the thimble like this, put it in the hand, put the hand in the pocket, and then there's a very small hole right here in the outside of the coat, and I just rub right here, and the thimble comes right out, you see? But it heals right up, you probably can't see it. There's another where I take the thimble like this, I put it in my hand, I put my hand in my pocket like this, up in the sleeve, it goes down the sleeve and lands on the finger. Watch. One where you go... Uh-oh. Oh, that's terrible. The only thing to do in a case like that is say, thank you for watching this again if you haven't seen it before and always remember the real magic words are WFAA TV we are the first to realize that the only thing constant in broadcasting is change how many times have you heard that WFAA has changed at the times by the death move 
of the quality touch. As television ended its first decade in Dallas, the country was about to enter the 60s. The times, they were a-changing. And so were the TV sets. They were portable. This model was actually a transistor set that you could take to the beach with you as long as you lugged along a heavy battery pack on your shoulder. And in 1959, the owners of Channel 8 decided it was time for them to make a change as well. So they decided to build a new state-of-the-art broadcast facility at Young and Record Streets. The groundbreaking was held on January 14, 1960. The site was at Young and Record Streets on the west end of downtown. Presiding were Mayor R.L. Thornton and Ted Dealey of the Dallas Morning News. WFAA, radio and television, have blazed the way in this great field and have contributed greatly to the progress and development of our city and the Southwest. This new building that we're now planning to start will be a beautiful thing for the whole city of Dallas. It will be a real beauty spot. It will include spacious studios and vast office areas and every piece of the equipment in it will be brand new. And over the next 14 months, a new state-of-the-art broadcast facility would take shape. On April 4th, the doors were opened. Well, of course, this was, uh, was going to be the show, showcase facility of the United States as far as uh, ABC was concerned, and it turned out to be the showcase facility of all broadcasting, and so we had what we call the Texas size opening and Texas size celebration. TV stars came in, and the studios were open to the public for tours. The first month, 60,000 people came to see. Everything was new. Julie Bunnell had a new kitchen to do her cooking show. There were new programs. Even the manager got into the act. This was our intro back in the year 1961. Later on, it was replaced by this caricature of yours truly. Mike had the idea of some kind of a, a sh program where we could answer questions of, of uh, people that uh, had questions about the industry, about the station, about personalities. The show was called Let Me Speak to the Manager, and it ran for 18 years. Station manager Mike Shapiro would answer viewers who wanted to know things like, if there are 8 million stories in the naked city, why do we have to watch repeats? Murphy Martin did a commentary last week about uh, having more conversation at home and uh, television interferes with conversation between parents and children and he recommended that you turn off the television set. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got the flack. Seven people called, said most of them thought or chose to think that Murphy was asking them to turn the television off and talk instead of listening to McGovern. Thirteen callers uh, for the commentary, one man said Murphy had the right idea. They turned the television off for 35 minutes. It helped two ways. They missed McGovern and they had a good conversation with their kids. <laughs> they ain't no way we're going to win. Shapiro <laughs> no, would also interview celebrities. The Dodge Company just bought time on my show and I told them in no uncertain terms, I will not drive a Dodge. I will tell the people that I drive a Lincoln Continental because I like a Lincoln Continental. But if I couldn't afford a Lincoln Continental, I might like the Dodge. I don't know. But I'm going to tell it to the viewer, and Dodge bought the time. Yeah. Now, what's wrong with that? It, it'll get you further with complete honesty than the hokey Well, it's not honest. I just don't want to drive less than a Lincoln Continental. I work very hard to drive a Lincoln Continental. What the hell do I want to drive a Dodge for? Although you rarely saw anything but the back of their heads, promotion director Casey Colmia and program director Jim Pratt would ask the questions. Mrs. Billy J. May of Denison writes, A local newspaper stated this week that a homosexual movie would appear on ABC November 21st. Will Channel 8 carry it? She adds, I hope not. He always felt that he had to represent the viewers since they didn't have a chance to represent themselves with, with the network. And that was his philosophy. And he says, well, what do the viewers want? And if they don't want, if they, if they want sex, well, okay. But he says, I don't think that's what they want on television. I don't think they want that in their living rooms. He come dragging a little letter back here and saying, what about this? Well, it was a letter, probably, we figured probably some malcontent or something, but it meant something to him. He wanted an answer for that problem that this person found with the station or with our coverage or with something, but 
he, uh, those letters meant a lot to him, and the people meant a lot to him. Jerry Haynes had been a well-known Channel 8 mainstay in the 50s, hosting programs such as Guest Book, Haynes Almanac, and Dallas Bandstand. But in the 60s, a younger audience discovered him. And Tommy Thompson phone called me in one morning and said, we need, uh, we were getting another cartoon to go with Felix the Cat and precede you, and we need some time filled. We need a host. Would you like to do a children's show? I got the idea for the coat and hat from the music man. We were going to have a music shop. Sam Smith said, why don't you uh, get a cane and wrap it in red and white and maybe have some candies. And uh, I said, okay. And then one morning coming to work two weeks before the show was to start at Gaston and Buckner Boulevard, the name Mr. Peppermint came into my uh, head. We would sing, Mr. Wiggly, please wake up, please wake up, please wake up. Mr. Wiggly, please wake up. Ah! We would like to see you presenting Mr. Wiggleyworm, who was the hero of our early years and the one most asked about. We used to get mail galore for him. They would send their Barbie doll stuff. They'd send their G.I. Joe stuff. We'd get sacks full of uh, items for Mr. Wiggleyworm. This is Mr. Wiggleyworm playing with a giraffe and a toy cowboy. It's drawn by Carl Cordell, who has a brother, Gary Don. Thank you, gentlemen. Both fellows are breakfast friends, and they send gifts, too. And that's the Mr. Peppermint Show for today. I'll see you Monday morning at 7.30, when it'll be time once again for Mr. Peppermint, the music shop, and the candy counter. As with Jerry Haynes, Ed Hogan had appeared on various programs at Channel 8, but he's probably best remembered as the host of Dialing for Dollars. Well, we took the phone books from Dallas, Fort Worth, surrounding cities and towns, and they took two books and they cut them up into little sections. And there were 12 on each section, 12 names and numbers. And we put them in a big drum, and then I would roll the drum and say, now it's time for dialing for dollars. <laughs> and you would pull a slip out, and I would count. The count today is two from the top, and the amount's $250. One, two, call that number. Many viewers will remember Big Don Norman hosting the Dialing for Dollars movies as well. Good evening, and welcome to the brightest half hour in Texas TV. From Communication Center in downtown Dallas, it's the award-winning Group and Chapman. You're from Big D. My, oh yes! It was a lip sync program where we would play music and the young people would move their mouths to it. And for its day, we were real proud of it. So we would program a musical program for 30 minutes. And once we decided what music we were going to use, we would assign the songs to each of the young people to go home and learn. When the show began, it was known as The Group and Harrigan because the host was known on KLIF radio as Irving Harrigan. The radio station said, though, that it owned the name. So the host changed his to Ron Chapman. And later down the line, he also changed radio stations. And at six minutes after eight o'clock in the morning on KVIL. We changed the program from the group in Harrigan on one Saturday night. On the next Saturday night, it was the group in Chapman. And it was amazing. Like that, people started calling me Chapman. Besides the group show, Chapman had also been doing a morning quiz show for Channel 8. Then the station decided to open a television studio in a newly completed shopping center called North Park. And Jim Rowley, the director of the show for all those years, was the man who came up with the term something else. And I think as soon as he came up with that, we all went, that's it. That's the name of the show.
It was a show that would bring young people from all over North Texas to North Park by 4.30 in the afternoon. And it became a North Texas meeting place for young people. One of the smartest things we did was find four young females whom we auditioned to become a dancing group on the show. They were the stars of the show. I recognize that I never was the star. The girls were the star. Joan Prather, Colleen Andereg, Del Fatigue, and Catherine Forney were the stars. You asked me in But there was a time in which young people just stopped coming to the studio. And that was the death of the show. It wasn't the ratings. The ratings were rather good. But those who came stopped coming. It was no longer the thing to do. And so the 1960s gave way to the 70s. The North Park Studios were shut down. Mr. Peppermint had been given notice. Channel 8 was looking for something different. My name is Don Harris, and this is Susie Humphreys. We have a program called News 8, etc. Now here's our own little... Untreated alcoholic down here. Well, they said they wanted to do a different kind of a morning show. There was only one at the time. It was the Today Show. They wanted to do something on a local le level, yet geared nationally. In other words, if there was something national breaking in the news, we would be there. We would have guests live on the show, people like George Bush. Or on the lighter side, we would have John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or all those wonderful stars. And then I met a man that was going to produce the show and was in charge of it by the name of Don Harris. Look at yourself on the monitor, Don. <laughs> <laughs> all you nice guys. And of course we all idolized him, every one of us. He was a hero to us. Shortly after the show went on the air, Don and Susie were joined by Gene Thomas. Then there was a three-way chemistry now that took place because we were all different in our own ways. Each one of us had something different to bring to the show. And what a show it really was. Do we have your attention? Wow. Um, is, is there uh, anything uh, s significant in the way that you stop and start the spray there? Uh, Your voice is cracking down. <laughs> and our relationship was that that was strictly on the air. And so it was fresh. It wasn't Ken and Barbie. These were real people. Things that we used to do, I dropped my skirt on television in front of him. The only link that you have not griped about. <laughs> you set me up. Wow, oh, you dirty dogs. <laughs> oh, I am good. Then there was that day Gene wrestled the tiger. Put the sleeper hold on him, Gene. <laughs> I want to put in some comments, but I can't stop laughing. He marches into the studio live on television, and there is a 700-pound Bengal tiger lying there, and he went, what? And we said, Don started laughing, and I started laughing. We said, you are going to wrestle the tiger. <laughs> it was one of the funniest bits because it was live. He didn't know anything about it, and that's the way he was. He just went with it. That's the way all of us did. In 1971, Gene Thomas was killed in a race car accident filming a segment for News 8, etc., Don Harris was the NBC correspondent killed at Jonestown in Guyana. Both were newsmen who also knew how to have fun. And News 8, etc. was part of a growing commitment to news that would make Channel 8 the first local station in the country to program four hours of news each day. This is News 8, the scene tonight. The sights and sounds of today. Of course, it didn't take long for television to become a permanent fixture in America's living rooms. The permanence was reflected by the set itself. Many were actual pieces of furniture, like this Zenith console model. And watching TV became part of our daily routine. For many, the day would end after watching the 10 o'clock news. Viewers learned that not only could television take them places they'd never been before, but it could also inform them of what was going on in their own backyards. You're looking at pictures of a killer tornado that hit Oak Cliff April 2nd, 1957. 
Its 21-mile path of destruction left 10 dead, 200 severely injured, and 621 buildings destroyed. The pictures were recorded by Channel 8 News photographers and then incorporated into a documentary which touted the station's news department. WFAA television news cameramen were on their way. Well, the job of a cameraman is to get pictures of the news, and that means getting to the scene immediately. Completely disregarding the danger involved, cameraman Malcolm Couch, John Starr, Forrest Moore, Jim Goodwin, and Channel 8 News director Jim Gibbs headed out at the first police report of the tornado sighting and chased the funnel across the city. Cameraman Marion Carlton took to the air with the aid of a Helix Air Transport helicopter to get aerial scene. In 1961, Channel 8 cameras recorded Hurricane Carla's 175 mile an hour winds. Carla forced the evacuation of 250,000 Texas residents from Corpus Christi to Port Arthur. 34 were killed. Weather has always been important to viewers. In 1955, Warren Culbertson was the Channel 8 weatherman. Wind blew in Texas today, and that means, well, sometimes it means two things. One he was succeeded by Dale Milford, who later became a congressman. And that's your evening edition weather. Stay with us now. Jerry Haynes, next with sports. In the 1950s, the new set looked like this. The Ham's Beer Final Edition with Dick Wheeler, Jerry Haynes, and Warren Culbertson. Others that followed included news anchor Bob Gooding and sportscaster Wes Wise. Wise would one day become mayor of Dallas. And Bert Shipp shot much of the news film. We, we learned a lot in the early days. There wasn't any manual how to, how to run television news. Or in those days, if you saw an ambulance, Bert Shipp usually wasn't far behind. Oh, we didn't chase ambulances all together. We went to 7-Eleven robberies. We went to city council. We went to commissioner's court. All the exciting stuff, you know. Anything violent, we were on it, though. We were good violent shooters. On November 22, 1963, Dallas newsmen were put to the test. Travis Lynn would soon be news director at Channel 8, and that day he was at the trademark. Bert Shipp, who's still the assignments editor at WFAA, uh, had been outside, came running inside and said, I don't know what's going on, but that motorcade just went by here at about 100 miles an hour and Kennedy's feet are sticking out. The Julie Bennell show was on when program director Jay Watson interrupted. Jacket will fit tightly around the hips, keeping that straight, sleek look that it should have. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but about 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. For the next four days, Channel 8 News was feeding the story to the entire country. The president was shot in the head. Conley was shot in the chest. Both of them are still alive when I left the hospital. This is Ed Hogan of WFAA Television in Dallas, Texas. We are standing on the grounds of Parkland Hospital, where President Kennedy was brought just uh, a few hours ago and has died, as most of you have already, uh, already know. Bob Walker, WFAA-TV, Dallas, Texas, interrupting. There's been a shooting at Dallas Police Station as Oswald was being transferred. As the Cowboys launched their tenderfoot season in the top... The Dallas Cowboys provided the city with a positive shot in the arm during the dark days following the assassination. In 1967, Dave Lane became sports director. The television station, uh, in my mind, uh, really kind of was a part of the magic of the call letters, WFAA. And uh, to go to work here, to me, was kind of like a lifetime dream come true. Lane beat out this man for the job. But Vern Lundquist did succeed Lane at the sports desk, then shed the horned rims to do play-by-play -play for CBS. Lane was no slouch himself. He went on to become station manager at Channel 8. The 1960s saw America's increased involvement in an unpopular war in Southeast Asia. Channel 8 News sent Bob Gooding to Vietnam to interview area soldiers. Gene Thomas went with Ross Perot to show the North Vietnamese how their prisoners were being treated at camps in Laos. And Channel 8 sent anchorman Murphy Martin along with the wives of area prisoners of war to Paris, Stockholm, and Rome to get answers about their husbands from the North Vietnamese. What is the main reason they cannot even know if their husbands are dead or alive? We don't keep uh, information from them. When those three ladies and my wife and I got to Paris, suddenly it was worldwide front page news because those three ladies became the first 
that the North Viet the first Americans that the North Vietnamese met with. To be a part of that, I think, first of all, speaks well for the station because the station financed that first trip. It was a Channel 8 project before it was a Ross Perot project. Channel 8 News on the move with Don Harris, Bob Gooding, Jack Van Roy, Vern Lundquist, and now Don Harris. Good evening. It's bad out tonight. In the 1970s, television news hit a growth spurt. When I became news director, um, we started tremendous growth as a news department. We were the number three station with about 15 staffers on the news department staff, a budget of about $150,000. We were doing two 30-minute newscasts a day. By 1968, we had 70 people on the staff. We were doing four hours of news a day. We were a dominant number one, and the budget was $1.2 million. But ratings so change, and so do news personnel. In 1973, Marty Haig had become news director. And the frustrating thing was that, that uh, as we started to make our move, everybody would say, well, gee, uh, you guys are better than the other guys. But then we'd get the rating book, and we wouldn't be. We'd be in third place. And... I was really frustrated. This is News 8 at 6. With Tracy Rowlett, Iola Johnson, John Criswell, Phyllis Watson, Chip Moody, Troy Dungan, and Dale Hansen. But patience proved to be a virtue. The Channel 8 News team would rise to the top once again. And by the 1980s would move toward dominance in the market. Here is a sampling of the work that has earned the Channel 8 News Department top honors in the field of broadcast journalism. A Delta L-1011 jetliner with more than 150 people apparently hit two cars. It crashed and it exploded in a severe uh, thunderstorm Friday. We were the first on the scene as far as any reporters go. There she, there is. she is. She's got a bandage on her head, Tracy, from what I can see. I see her eyes open, I think. He told Channel 8's John Sparks his story. I received uh, $25,000 to attend SMU, and Bootsy Larson paid me. Do either of you recognize the handwriting on any of those envelopes? Bobby? Bob? This one is SMU stationary. Other people's money. The savings and loan crisis. Reported by Byron Harris. And the people who believe in a a level playing field owe the vindication of their faith to investigative broadcast journalism. To WFAA and its team of reporters, a DuPont Columbia Award. Want to make a real vacation buy? Earl Hayes is selling 55 1962 Chevrolet Impala hardtop four-door sports sedans during the Impala bargain days at Earl Hayes. <laughs> days a week, we open up at 7. And seven days a week, we're open till 11. From 7. Till 11. From 7. Till 11. We got ice. Drinks. Milk. Cheese. Meat. Fish. Bread. Peas. We got soup to nuts. That's why we sing. 7-Eleven's got everything. This early commercial featuring the Allen Rooster won numerous awards for 7-Eleven and was one of the first commercials seen on television in Dallas and Fort Worth. People frequently complain about commercials. They're either too loud, there are too many of them, or they're just simply obnoxious. But what they often forget is that they also pay the bills. And for years, they've entertained us as well. It's also interesting to look back at how early sponsors tried to get our attention. Here are some samples of some produced right here at our Channel 8 studios. Come on down and get a TCLC loan. Uh -huh. Come on down and get a TCLC loan. Here's the place to get it set. Come on down and get a TCLC loan. At Texas Consumer Finance, you'll find a loan for every need. Medical loans, travel and vacation loans, down payment loans for things you'd like to buy. Oh, brother, they've got to be kidding. I know. And you know, that's more than the monthly payments on the new car that John and Mary just bought. Well, where in the world did they get a deal like that? Downtown. At Johnson Chevrolet. 
Fine Pontiac's nationally famous 2 CEP again smashes through the two-car price barrier. I think it was a fine battle, don't you, Henry? Remember, Gumdrop, 7-Up is the happy drink for happy people. So when your mother goes to the grocery store today, say, Mother, be sure to get lots of 7-Up Super King, the kind they used this morning in the Battle of Swordfish Sea. All you have to do is, and you're set to enjoy Black Label's treat of premium quality at the popular price. Pure refreshment. This new Lone Star glass can is pure glass, and glass protects the natural beer flavor of certified quality Lone Star. The rain checker made by Dickies, inspired by Pat Boone. We've asked this young man about town to come over from the campus to model the Dickies rain checker. It's my wife. Where? Uh, right behind you. Are you sure? I'm positive. What shall we do? Uh, well, uh, act like we just met. Uh, Wait a minute, she's not looking now. Which one? The short one in the green hat. Uh, think of something to talk about. Oh, well, uh, 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 do you know that bread costs no more at 7-Eleven store? Uh, I'm from Lone Star Gas. Are you the one that called about modernizing your heating system? I certainly did. Walk right in that friendly door. The TCLC friendly door. Walk right in that friendly door, the TCFC money store. Walk right in that friendly door. Products aren't the only thing sold on television. Stations also use the time during station breaks to promote other programs. We call these spots promos. What else? And here are some promos about Channel 8 programs that aired over the years. The North Vietnamese call him abrasive. Mickey Mantle calls him pal. Martin Luther King called him an honest man. We call him a good friend. Murphy Martin, distinguished newsman. Welcome him back home again on News 8, Monday, September 4th, at 6 and 10 p.m. Etc. Reactive information programming. Backwards, that's no grabbing bit in the lips, no. Hi, teen guys and teen gals. Got your tan shoes and pink shoelaces. Because it's rock and roll week on. Dialing for Dollars movie. Your host with the most. Ross Cass. We'll be reeling out these five fine flicks. For all you groovy guys. And gorgeous chicks. The boy and I spend a lot of time just walking in the woods. We don't own any land in Texas yet. I guess that's why we spend so much time looking at it. I grew up on a farm in Georgia, and I've never gotten over the need to see things grow. With a total outdoors of 10 by 20 feet of patio, we spend most of our time putting things in pots and cans. Tomatoes are good, though. The boys already learned that when things get rough, you go back home. Back to the women. All three of ours. After all, that's where the strength is. Girls, even my own, are still something of a mystery to me. The family man. The newsman. Don Harris. Watch News 8 when you really want to know. It was only half enough. In our push-button plastic and space-aged era, news stories are happening constantly. To keep pace with the news of the 70s, Channel 8 intensifies its efforts to probe deeper and more comprehensively into the events of the new decade. What goes up must come down. Spinning wheel got to go round. Children play in the park. They don't know. I'm alone in the dark. People had dedication. There was a lot of pride in product. They wanted to be the best. You know, there are really two things that make a television station successful. First and foremost, it's you, the viewer. If you don't watch, we fail. And of course, while it's impossible to please everyone at all times, our primary purpose is to serve you. The other key to a station's success are the people who work there. And the folks who make this place tick take great pride in their work, and they always have. 
make this house destined for the education and entertainment of the multitudinous people in this metropolitan area. I was a kid and watched Channel 8, I sensed there was something going on here. Uh, when I finally was able to come and be a part of it, I found out that I was right. It's a creative colony. It's always been a place where people who have something to offer in television can come and be given an opportunity. Channel 8 attracts such a quality of, of artist, be it technical or be it creative on, on camera, and, and journalism. My goodness, journalism. They simply wrote the book and are untouchable. <laughs> Stand by to pitch Dukakis. Yeah, I don't know where to go. This is election day, 1988. Chelly News. Are you all going to want to go live at 50 or wait till 53? And God bless America. The opportunity to work with that caliber of people was really exciting. I'll never forget it, and I will always be better for the things that I learned. God didn't mean for those pictures to go flying through the air. <laughs> Let's face it, it is, it is the best, it is the best television house, uh, grooming place. You learn to do things right when you work at Channel 8. Where you, uh, you really got to watch your backside. If you step away from it and you look at the kind of people who work here day in and day out, they are not only good, but they're very special. I love television. I really did. I still, well, I still think it's got a way to go. I think it can do so much to, to educate and to teach. That teacher enlightens and opens the way for better understanding. I'm Gil Smith, TV cameraman for Channel 8, wishing a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you and yours. We talk about the spirit of Texas uh, in recent years. There's a spirit of Channel 8 television that I think's always been around, and you can feel it. Spirits happening here on Channel 8 in the morning light. But I've got to work my fingers to the bone. When the evening comes, I just lock the door and reach for my remote. Well, I see your spirit, and I can hear it, and I can feel it deep down inside. Cause I know. And so there you have it, a quick look back at 40 years of television here at Channel 8. We hope you've enjoyed this trip down memory lane as much as we have, and we hope you'll stay tuned to Channel 8 for the next 40 years as well. In the meantime, thank you very much for being with us, and good night.
This is WFAA TV Channel 8 Dallas. We're a television service of Below Broadcasting Corporation. As this day in beautiful North Texas comes to an end, we hope we've been a pleasant part of your day. We strive for quality and are happy to display this National Association of Broadcasters seal of good practice. We hope you've had a good day and that you'll join us again tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>